some things for both the pest control and lawn care side um, as we go through the, the formulations topic. All right, Susan, if you wanna go ahead and uh, get us going. Awesome, thank you, Sam. Good morning, everyone. We would like to welcome, welcome you to our first Friday webinar series. My name is Susan Manning. I'm your key account manager for the East Coast. We wanna thank you for giving us some of your morning for this education. Today, we are discussing formulations and their uses with Dr. Ben Hamza and Bob Allwright from our Global Specialty Solutions team. Ben is our research and development leader with more than 25 years experience. Ben is known throughout the industry as a technical expert and customer advocate. Bob is our research scientist with more than 20 years lab experience, including formulation, design, and development. I'm now gonna go turn the call over to Ed DeMass for a little housekeeping before we begin the presentation. Thank you, uh, Susan, appreciate that. Uh, just a couple notes for you. First, I want to start by letting you know what states were approved in. It's always nice to just go through a laundry list so that you hear your state. Uh, Arizona, Connecticut, Delaware, District of Columbia, Florida, Hawaii, Indiana, Michigan, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Texas, Utah, and West Virginia. All of those states are allowing us to provide CEUs to you for today's webinar. Uh, we will follow up with an email that'll give you instructions on various things. And if there's anything that we need you to do to fill out a form or something like that, we'll be sending that to you. So um, you can just uh, know that the onus is on us to get to you to make sure. Many of the states, we just need to register um, register your license number. No, North Carolina, uh, I, I see your note in the chat. Uh, North Carolina uh, requires several hours of uh, webinars it, 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 at the same time. So unfortunately, when we do one hour webinars, we're not allowed to, to give them. Um, okay, so in the middle of the presentation, Ben and Bob will have a couple of keywords. The states require this so that we know that you're uh, you're, you're not playing your PlayStation, that you're actually paying attention. Um, so you're going to go into the chat and type in the code word that they ask you to type in. Uh, also, the Q&A, feel free to ask as many questions as you like. We'll answer everything we possibly can during and after. And if we run too long, then we'll send out those questions with answers as well. Um, and then the last thing is right at the end of the presentation, there is a quiz. Uh, we need to do that while you're on here. So I will send a link right after the presentation. You guys can all go get on. It takes about two minutes and we'll do the Q&A during that time. Uh, lastly, remember next month, July 9th, after the holiday weekend, so we'll push back a little, July 9th at 1030, we have flea and tick control. So there's another great opportunity to get uh, credits in different categories in many states. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Ben and Bob to talk about formulations. Great, thank you, uh, Ed. Uh, I appreciate the uh, introduction from Susan. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, the topic of today is pesticide formulation and their uses. My colleague, Bob Albright, the principal uh, formulation chemist for FMC Global Specialty Solutions will be uh, leading the call and I will be uh, providing a couple updates from an operator and applicator standpoint. So with that, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Bob. Great, thank you, Ben. And next slide, please. So this morning we're talking about pesticide formulations. When you 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 know the uh, technical aspects of formulations and when to use one formulation over another. When we talk about pesticide formulations, what we're doing is talking about the addition or the combination of an active ingredient, the insecticide, herbicide, fungicide, to a group of inert ingredients, and what what a pesticide formulation really uh, improves is the ability for the user to get a good homogeneous uh, 
fully potent dose of in dose of pesticide into their spray tank and onto the application. Um, so everybody knows active ingredients. Uh, we talk about them all the time. The inert ingredients are what gives the formulation the ability to become homogeneous, to become um, suspendable um, and have good application. Uh, the inert ingredients might include water or other organic solvents, emulsifiers, um, dry carriers, if we're talking about a dispersible granule. If we're talking about a non-dispersible granule, it'll be the, the, um, uh, the inert clay type of material, if you will. We also might include uh, spreaders, stickers. We use wetting agents to provide the ability for the AI to wet out into the water carrier. And then also, of course, we use preservatives and uh, odor modifiers or fragrances. Next slide. So what is a pesticide? This is the actual definition from, the, from FIFRA section 2U. This is what the EPA defines as a pesticide. Okay, the important thing, substance or mixtures of substances. So if you're talking about uh, two AIs, three AIs, they're included as a group. And um, these products are used to prevent, um, uh, destroy, repel, or mitigate pests. And those pests could be um, weeds, they could be insects, they could be funguses. Also, nitrogen stabilizers are considered uh, fertilizers. So why add inert ingredients? So AIs, active ingredients, technical pesticides tend to be, they're certainly highly potent. They're 95, 100% active, 100% of a certain molecular configuration. They can be solids, they can be, you know, crystals, they could be large crystals, they could be powders, they could also be liquids, they could be waxy solids, they could be, you know, molasses looking sorts of things. And the reason why we build a formulation is so that you can take these highly active AIs and you can um, conceive a dose. Uh, whether it's one ounce of formulation per gallon of water or um, you know, uh, a dry ounce per 10 gallons of water, whatever the case may be. But what it gives you is the ability to handle that pesticide in a safe and easy manner. And it helps in measuring and mixing pesticides. Lastly, it makes the AI better. Okay, one of the things formulation folks try to do is improve penetration of the AI either onto the insect or into the plant surface or make sure it stays on the plant surface and not is, and is not uh, penetrating the plant. So for instance, in a fungicide, some fungicides are uh, surface uh, fungies and what we wanna do is leave the fungicide on the surface. We don't want it absorbed into the plant. And there are ingredients and methods of production of pesticides that will lend that characteristic to the product. And next slide. So we talk about SCs and EWs and um, WPs. These are the formulation designations as laid out by CPAC, which is an international uh, organization for all worldwide pesticide scientists. So this is something to have in your back pocket. Um, you know, there are all kinds of powders, there are dustable powders, there are powders for seed treatment, there are ECs that you all know about. There's EWs that you current, currently commonly use, but also uh, the inverse of an EW. So an EW is an oil 
in water emulsion, but we also can make water in oil emulsions or what is called an inverted emulsion. But that has a designation too. So all of these designations are what you see on the labels of the uh, products that you purchase. <clears throat> the next slide. By the way, that's only a partial list. I have a full list at the back of the uh, slide deck. So Ben, do you want to sure. talk through this one? Yes, absolutely, Bob. Thank you. So, uh, in, for from an operator and an applicator standpoint, whether it's a lawn care operator or a pesticide op, uh, applicator (PMP), there are uh, ways to look at the formulation. That's why this topic is very critical because each formulation has advantages and disadvantages. So you wanna you wanna be fully aware of what a formulation is because you want to know what the advantages and disadvantages are. Uh, and also, um, based upon the formulation choice, it's going to dictate for your operation, your production environment, your client base, your customers, your applicators, um, how and when those materials are, are going to be applied. That's why it's really important for, for applicators to really understand the crux of what a formulation chemistry is, not just that the AI is effective, but also what that formulation package uh, looks like. That's, uh, that's very important. Um, and then is the formulation good enough to achieve results? Is the formulation good enough to withstand environmental conditions, to, to withstand production environment, to withstand being in a tank or in a tube or in a backpack or in a, uh, you know, sprayer out on a, on, on a rig. Uh, so that's, those are all uh, important variables. And then the other thing, what does the form, what happens to the formulation when you mix it with water, particularly if you have to take X amount of ounces and X amount of gallons of water for a specific, you know, spray volume. Uh, so those are the types of things that are important. Water quality, we're gonna talk about this later on, it is important. And most importantly, your, your application equipment. Uh, it would dictate how you would select the formulation and, and really what Bob's going to go through in, in the next slide provides you the additional detail for many common formulation and talks about advantages and disadvantages. Bob, back to you. Thank you. So, you know, when we're talking about formulations, as Ben says, there's a formulation for every use. The first one would be an SL. Um, Certainly FMC sells a solitaire WSL, so the SL is there. Uh, this can either be a liquid or a dry substance that is dissolved in water, or water is the carrier in the jug for the product. Uh, it's a solution. It can be clear, it can be colored, but it is truly a, a, a molecular solution. The molecules are, are uh, so to speak, flowing freely through the uh, uh, water matrix. Next slide. The nice thing about solutions is, hey, they're easy to handle. You don't need agitation beyond, um, beyond marginal agitation to make sure that the solution is fully, fully dissolved in your uh, bulk water tank. It's easy on equipment. There's no abrasion uh, of equipment. There's no visible residue. And of course, solutions are nice. They can be used indoors and outdoors. There's also, they tend to be very low odor or zero odor uh, associated with them. Some of the disadvantages though of solutions is the pH of the dilution water. So, these molecules, the AI molecules, are dissolved in water. We tend to buffer them so that the uh, pH of the water is fairly neutral, usually between five, pH 5 and pH 8. Uh, if, you, uh, if your water of dilution, your tank water, uh, B&G, the water in the B&G, is has a lot of uh, alkalinity or acidity, you might actually precipitate out the AI at very low pHs or very high pHs. That tends not to happen and it tends to be a uh, 
very slow process, so to speak. Many times you'll have water that is a little bit high in pH. And if you were to let that sit for a week, uh, you could get precipitation of the AI. But in the hour or two hours it takes to do the application, it's perfectly uh, soluble. The other thing with solutions is that they are absorbed into surfaces. If you have a porous surface, the water, um, the water spray will typically be absorbed into it. And so you sometimes have reduced residual activity. Next slide. The next formulation type is suspension concentrate. Uh, certainly FMC products, we're talking about Talstar Pro, we're talking about Dismiss. Uh, FAME, our new fungicide system, Kalita. Suspension concentrates are when the solid AI is dispersed in water. And it's dispersed, uh, we disperse it into a um, surfactant, a water surfactant system that suspends the particle for long periods of time. Uh, the, we, we, devise ways, typically grinding the product, but you can also do it through precipitation reactions where you um, end up with a small particle size between one and 10 microns typically. Uh, we add thickeners to the uh, formulation so that the particles stay suspended in the water. They don't they don't aggregate and collapse onto the bottom of the, of the container. Um, SCs have grown in popularity over wettable powders because there's no dusting, there's no worker exposure. Uh, they're very efficacious, uh, certainly as effective as formulations such as ECs. Uh, they're really quite a, uh, elegant formulation. It takes a little bit of art and science to get a good SC that uh, retains its suspendability over, over months and a year of shelf life, years of shelf life. Uh, they tend to be low odor products. Next slide. So a suspension concentrate again, if you look to the right, suspensions or SCs, the particle size is a micron, between one and 10 microns, maybe up to 15 microns. A colloidal solution is actually a microparticle of product. This tends to be smaller than a micron, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 nanometers, 1,000 nanometers in a micron. And then a true solution, going back to the uh, uh, SL type of formula. This is actually a uh, molecular solution where the molecules of the AI are actually dissolved in the water. Okay, so suspension, uh, really the largest um, uh, water-based formulation typically used. And next slide. Oh, Ben, this is yours. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I talked about, you know, the formulation, the list, et cetera. And, and I mentioned, you know, the user uh, and the applicator, they have to really consider what formulation to use, et cetera. So when Bob talks about the particle and particle size, and particularly for a, uh, an LCO setting, you know, lawn care operator uh, setting, or even, you know, pest control operator uh, setting, things can happen over time. So Bob talked about the water quality, the pH, he mentioned, you know, precipitation, you know, et cetera. It's very important to recognize that over a period of time, the equipment itself, if you have tanks to kind of uh, do a regular evaluation on, 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 on the tanks, because you have impurities, you have a lot of inert material that over time accumulates. Uh, Bob also mentioned for the liquids, you don't need a lot of agitation, but for other formulation, agitation is very critical to keep things in, in, in suspension. So when you're looking at a formulation, also be mindful of your production equipment. I mentioned it already. Uh, if you have equipment, if you have hard water, for example, a hard water classified as typically high pH, 
with a lot of uh, uh, soluble minerals, uh, calcium, magnesium, iron, etc. That's soluble in, in the water. You know, carbonates. Those compounds interact with the product in, 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 in the formulation and may yield, particularly when you have a lot of impurities, uh, sediments. So that is something to be uh, you know, mindful of. And oftentimes when you look at efficacy or look at product performance, uh, you know, be aware that if you choose a formulation and the formulation says agitate well, you wanna, you wanna have equipment that agitates. And I'm sure equipment, you know, uh, particularly spray equipment for lawn can operators. You have strainers to check on the strainers to, to check on the water quality. Um, and and just, just be aware that over time, you want to consider um, having kind of a routine inspection of your, you know, production equipment because the formulation, you know, product goes in and out, day in and day out for, for months o over time, things could accumulate which would impact the performance. And I'm just giving you kind of a, an overview where that comes from. So it could be the water source, it could be impurities. If you're mixing with fertilizers, for example, particularly fertilizers with head that have uh, phosphorus, in, in essence, you know, those create conditions that may congregate with the colloids and, and lead to, to uh, you know, settlement. So uh, that's what can happen over time. It doesn't mean it does happen, but just, we wanted you to be mindful of that, so, Bob? Okay, thank you, Ben. Hey, uh, before we leave this slide, let me make a couple of comments also. So Ben mentioned uh, calcium, magnesium, iron, phosphorus. These are all dye and trivalent ions that are readily available in various water sources. Um, formulators, guys like me, uh, both at FMC and other companies, we actually look for uh, compatibility short term uh, with respect to water hardness. And those there are um, there are published methods that most formulators use to look at um, to look at the ability for all formulations to uh, remain in. Uh, good quality, so to speak, in the water of dilution over time, but not for long periods of time. These tests run for 24 hours. And certainly the idea of cleaning your spray equipment is paramount because like everything else, you get built up over time um, and that needs to be addressed from application time to application time. Okay, next slide. So, uh, I want to spend a few, just a few moments talking about your, your typical ECs that everyone grew up loving, as well as oil and water emulsions or EWs. These are also pretty widely used in the industry. In both cases, these are, uh, in the EC case, these are uh, solid or liquid AIs that are solubilized in an organic solvent. Uh, and mixed with an emulsifier. And then when you dilute it in water, you form a little micelle. And that's the picture you see on the right-hand side of the screen. The oil is the portion that also holds the AI in it. We use surface active ingredients or surfactants. Uh, some people might call them detergents, but they're really not quite detergents, they're surfactants. And what they are are surface active agents where you have a hydrophobic tail or an alkyl tail. That's the brown tail that leads into the water. And then you have a partitioning portion of the molecule that kind of divides the oil layer from the water, uh, the bulk water. And then you have an anionic portion. Here in this case, it's an SO3 group, uh, but it could be, you know, uh, sodium salt, an acid, you know, an acid uh, uh, moiety on the molecule. Okay, um, so ECs are the organic phase. And when you throw it into your spray tank, that's where the water is involved in the diagram. 
in EWs, what we do is we take highly concentrated ECs and, and with high shear form a very concentrated emulsion that we then package. So the EW is the oil in water that is already in the container for your use. ECs are just the oil and AI portion. A product uh, that FMC sells that is an EW is called Quicksilver. This is a carfentrazone EW. Next slide. So ECs, again, uh, active ingredients that are uh, dissolved in a petroleum-based solvent. We add an emulsifier. And then when you pour it into water, you see the diluted form looks like milk, okay? It's colloidal. It's a colloidal emulsion. These products, FMC, we sell products such as Baseline or Dragnet are our ECs. Next slide. So advantages and disadvantages of ECs, they're easy to work with. They require little agitation. Once the emulsion is formed in your spray tank, they're easy on the equipment. They're not abrasive and they leave little residue. Some of the disadvantages, there could be phytotoxicity with ECs. ECs, especially in the concentrated form, in the form, in the product form, uh, can be absorbed through the skin. Depending on the flash point of the ECs, there might be shipping or storage issues. So sometimes you have to look for the, uh, the, uh, the safety diagram on the side of any company's bottles to see how uh, you can ship it and store it. The other thing with ECs is they're a little tough, tougher than EWs or SLs or SCs on rubber and plastic hoses and spray washers and gaskets. Depending on the solvent used, you could actually dissolve these over time. Next slide. Ed. So um, Ed has mentioned this in, in the beginning. At this point, um, we would like for all participants to uh, enter the keyword that's shown on uh, the screen. Sorry, I was double uh, muted. So. Go ahead, Ed. Also, just a couple of quick questions that were asked in the chat. I'll just say them rather than type them. Yes, we are approved in Florida. And uh, let's see, what was the other one? If I can get to it. Um, Florida, Florida, here it is. Um, is the recording gonna be shared? Yes, we, we do house uh, prior webinars on our first Friday's page. So I just added that to the chat. You can always find it later and bookmark it. I think you're good to move on. Probably we've got just about everybody. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Good. Thank you. So we continue on with various formulations here. Um, the next group are microencapsulated or capsule suspension uh, formulations. This is a technology where we take an AI, maybe uh, disperse it in um, a surfactant system or we dissolve it in an organic solvent. And what we do is we, um, we basically uh, place it inside of a polymer shell, a membrane, okay? And so they're really microscopic beads. Uh, this is done to encapsulate the AI product. Yeah, it extends the shelf life of products. There is more uh, residual activity. We sometimes do it um, with more toxic AIs so that once it's encapsulated, 
uh, it leads to a better worker profile, a worker safety profile. Um, they are basically SCs, but instead of the AI being raw or unencapsulated, the AI is encapsulated into a little marble, little, little uh, micron sized marble, if you will. And next slide. So again, low odor because they're basically water, uh, the uh, continuous phase, if you will, is water. Uh, depending on the size of them, we don't want to, we want the particles to be small enough so you don't get any clogging up sprayers, uh, clogging up screens, that sort of thing. By the way, formulators across the board, FMC and other companies, we, we all build this into our formulations. We're constantly thinking about the, our client base with regard to sizing of product, with regard to the, uh, the ability of the product to pass through the application system. It has good stability on uh, getting back to encapsulated and capsule suspension technology. We have good stability on porous surfaces because these capsules kind of lie on the surface. Um, the capsules will open up, they'll either degrade or they will rupture based on osmotic pressure. Um, and they're a little bit more costly. Uh, it's, they cost more to produce and there are uh, polymer ingredients that are uh, included in the formulations. Typically, we build the polymer uh, really in silico, which, which means at the time of production, we have an AI solution. We have two or three ingredients, monomers, that, that when you have intimate mixing, they will form the polymer in real time around the uh, AI, and then that product is then deposited into a uh, into a uh, um, water continuous phase. And next slide. So, um, I'm sorry, I saw one thing. The uh, so the next the next system I'd like to talk about are microemulsions. Uh, they're MEs. These are enhanced uh, suspended liquids. They're basically uh, somewhere between nanoparticles and colloids that are um, suspended, if you will, into an or, or an or partially organic, partially aqueous system. And what they form on dilution in water is a transparent what you might look at and say, oh, it's a solu solution, but really it's a suspension of nanoparticles or uh, micelles. Uh, they, um, they mix to a clear solution for application. They dry clear. There's no settling or clogging of, of screens. They're really good stability once they're mixed into the uh, into the spray tank, they are just, they are just um, really quite uh, stable with regard to, uh, there is no settling of the product over time. It actually looks like a solution. Typically you get enhanced biological uptake. They're great for uh, insecticides um, because they will readily penetrate the uh, insect shell or insect, uh, the surface of the insect. And they're also uh, quite cost effective. One of our lead products is Transport Micron. So again, there are 100, uh, a micron particle size is a nanoparticle or a microparticle. It's 100 times smaller than an SC. You think back to an earlier slide where I had an SC having a size of one to 10 microns. This is a hundred times smaller, smaller than that. Could be a hundred nanometers, could be 50 nanometers. And every time you go from a, a one micron to
to 100 microns, that's a 10x dilution or a 10x uh, decrease in size, but you actually increase the number of particles by a cubic factor. And so you can, so for every SC particle, you might have up to a thousand micron particles. So the idea of this, you know, insect interacting with that particle is increased, uh, uh, you know, uh, a thousand times or up to a thousand times. So you have good uptake. Um, no, that's okay. Go, go on, Sam. Thanks. Uh, the next group of products are aerosol products. These are ready to use products. Everybody has them on their truck, in one form or another. They're very low concentration, low AI concentration. They tend to be used indoors rather than outdoors because of the aerosol nature of them. You can have a lot of uh, drift. Uh, our indoor products are CB80 and D-Force. When you look at the can here, you know, it's like any other aerosol can, except we also include a straw on it for a pinpoint delivery of product, either at the uh, opening of, a, of an ant trail, for instance, or being able to get up next to a range or a dishwasher or down inside a um, drain trap. Next slide. Other formulations that we uh, work on are pastes and gels. These are typically for insecticides. We make these pastes and gels to be attractive to the insect, it's kind of basically a food matrix in one form or another. They tend to be in stations or syringes that can be applied uh, spot treatment. They're odorless because they are food products. There's no organic solvents or anything like that. Min minimal exposure to uh, your client base, for instance, to the homeowner. Uh, they're easy to place, easy to apply. When we say they melt at high temperatures, we mean quite high temperatures, all right? They, they don't belong inside of a range or an oven or anything like that. but we engineer these pastes and gels to withstand 40 or 50 degrees C, maybe 140 degrees F temperatures. Because they're food products, they may stain a porous surface. That's typically why we uh, use these in bait stations or really spot treatment out of the way in corners. Um, remember that every product has a shelf life associated with it. Once we open a station or start injecting uh, syringe gels or pastes, um, there's a finite lifespan to them. They need to be, you know, cleaned up on your next visit or whatever the, uh, whatever the time period is on the label and uh, removed. The next slide. There are also dusts and granules. And yeah, there are differences. Dusts are one of the earliest forms of uh, pesticides. Uh, these are uh, can be applied directly to a surface or under a bed or in a corner, whatever the case may be. And that dust is residual. You know, it's not diluted in water. It's just applied directly to the uh, surface. They have good residual, dusts last quite a long time, and they have a very low active ingredient. And the dust itself is fine and, and it uh, is used with inert carrier. Dusts can be irritating to um, the user, to the applicator. Okay, so we need, uh, need to be careful with that. Typically our products, we have a product called Sign Off. I think there's a picture of it on the next slide, Sam. Nope, not quite yet. Uh, again, wettable powders, uh, good residual, excellent on porous surfaces. Oh, so a wettable powder is different from a dust. Sorry about that. Wettable powder is different from a dust. Dust is applied directly from the, uh, from the little uh, pump 
or puffer bottle. A wettable powder is, is put into your uh, water tank where it disperses and uh, forms a, um, you know, a uh, dispersion in water. It's not as robust as an SC on dilution. They tend to settle with time. Um, quite often, wettable powders come in soluble bags. So a single bag goes into a tank of a certain volume of water. They're um, less, less harmful to plants, animals, and surfaces than an EC. And there's very little absorption uh, through the skin. There is an inhalation hazard if you're working directly with the wettable powder and it does need constant agitation. And they can be abrasive on pumps and nozzles. Next slide. Ed? Ben? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, at this point, we, uh, we would like our participants to enter the keyword that's, that's shown on uh, this slide, please. And uh, Ed, feel free to comment if you'd like. Sorry, I, my screen locked up. I don't, I apologize. Yeah, type in tank mixture compatibility into the chat, which you're doing. Um, and continue to ask your questions. I know um, we've had some of them answered directly and then we've got a few in there. If they're not answered right now, we're more than likely saving them so that we can talk about them at the end when you're doing your quiz. Okay, if you guys want to keep going, I think we're getting the majority of them in. Okay, thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> ah, okay, so here are pictures. So here's a uh, sign off dust uh, applicator. Okay, this is the product we sell. And again, it's a dust, it's used directly right out of that applicator. Uh, picture on the right is a picture of a granule that we sell. This is Talstar Extra on Verge. This is a combination of bipenthrin and zeta cypermethrin on a dust-free granule. So dusts are one application method and then granules for lawn care use, perimeter use. This is a different application. This is our Verge technology. So it's a dust-free applicator. Uh, next slide. Uh, the next formulation type are water dispersible granules, WDGs, DGs, WGs, DFs. They're all the same. Okay, whether anyone likes it or not, they're all the same. Um, we sell products called Blindside or Solitaire DG. These are herbicides. They're, they are agglomerated wettable powders. It sounds easy, it's not. <laughs> we start with a um, milled powder, not unlike a wettable powder, and then we add uh, surfactants and we uh, can use any number of different um, engineering methods to agglomerate this product. And then what we do is we particles, we particle size it, we sieve it, we uh, grind it and sieve it to give it a certain particle size uh, distribution. This um, gives a product that acts actually better than a wettable powder because it has more surfactant in it, but it is uh, very low to zero dust for the applicator to use. Um, and when it's thrown into water and uh, agitated, it actually forms a better suspension than wettable powders. So 
So formulation summary. Um, I'll make a couple of comments and I let it for Ben because he's really, he knows this better than I. So what we're doing as pesticide formulation scientists is number one, coming up with elegant formulations that takes an AI and with the use of inert ingredients, surface active ingredients, uh, inert ingredients, as well as water organic solvents and gives you our client a formula that from dose to dose into your spray tank is homogeneous, fully potent, and is easy to use. Uh, we think through each of our formulation steps with regard to your performance and your customer acceptance. We think about worker safety and we think about phytotoxicity. Then, yeah, thanks, Bob. And and then the uh, other bullet point is consideration for application equipment, for spray volume, or if you will, delivery mechanisms. How is that product going to be delivered by our users? And we recognize that our end users have client base that is demanding that that demand quality, that demand non staining, no odor, all of those types of things. Bob went through the extent of the work that creates a formulation that finally en ends up getting the designation SC, uh, WDG, et cetera. So we hope that this, this summary gave you a pretty good overview of what that means. Um, and FMC and I, and uh, we'll have a few slides here at, at the end. Um, in the end, it's the variety of, of high, high performing products, whether in the dry or liquid formulation, uh, that our industry needs, and, and, we, and we recognize that. And we wanted to kind of give you an overview of what FMC does to kind of help you help our end users um, achieve their goal. Uh, one, one final slide, uh, Sam, if you don't mind, I think we have one or two slides left. I'm gonna go back, and I mentioned this in the beginning, to the, to the tank mixes. So whenever you, for, particularly for LCOs, that are need for having a combination of a pre-immersion, post-immersion herbicide, or uh, two herbicides, one for crabgrass, one for, for you know, yellow nut sedge. And sometimes you wanna combine fertilizers. Sometimes you wanna throw in iron in, in the mix. So questions often come up when you have a need to combine three or four different products that have different chemistry, different formation, different pHs, um, it's very, very important for our uh, users to not only be aware of the formulation, but also to do the due diligence with respect to tank mix compatibility uh, of, of products that have different you know, formulation. And that can be achieved really by conducting what we, what we call, or you know it as jar test. You, you put the products in, in a jar, you shake it so they're gonna simulate agitation and then watch it you'll be able to see, does it look uniform, et cetera. It doesn't tell you whether the products are gonna perform from a biological standpoint in, uh, in the way that you would expect. So from time to time, if you're new to this or you have new formulation, it would be a good idea not only uh, to, to do the chart test, but also to do a quick test, get like an old hand can sprayer in an inconspicuous area around the shop and, and put it out and, and see what it does. Um, and also, we didn't want to go into this area, but there are ways and there are steps that you would follow uh, to um, add mixed products together. It's, it's known as the whales method. So um, at some point, you may see uh, from, from Susan Manning um, a document that kind of goes through the jar testing and tank mix procedures. Uh, kudos to our colleague, Dr. Tina Bond, for, for developing that piece for our uh, end user. So at this point, um, I'll just pause here, Sam, and uh, if you don't mind, go to, to, to the next slides. So really, the, uh, you know, these slides uh, provide you a, the breadth of the FMC product line insecticides on, on this one. Next one, Sam. Herbicides, and then I think the last one is uh, 
fungicides. Um, so with that, Sam, uh, back to you and Ed. Yeah, absolutely. So I will hand it to Ed here to uh, get the quiz running and give a little reminder on details. Uh, and then we have uh, three really good questions that came in through the Q&A that uh, I'll pass on to you and Bob, Ben. I am putting the link to the quiz right now in the chat. Um, there you go. It's a survey monkey link. Very easy. It, it's less than 20 questions and more than half of them are your name and your address and your license number, that kind of thing. So please go do that now. Click on the link. If it doesn't work, click on it twice. Um, it, 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 we use this every month. It, it's a, a very simple process. Uh, and while you're doing that, we will go ahead and answer some questions and, and feel free to keep putting questions in here when you're done with your uh, quiz. All right, so uh, first question in was from Tony Curtis. So Bob, um, Tony asked, basically how does the shelf life of different formulations vary? What uh, impact does the formulation type have on the, the shelf life of the product? <laughs> So it's a great question. And I will give you the, by rote, what the EPA says. The EPA says that all formulations registered in the United States have a minimum of two years of shelf life, unless we find that we cannot achieve two years of shelf life. And that shelf life is at ambient temperature. Okay, so about room temp, in which case we need to specify an expiration date. So in other words, and I'm not picking on any particular product, but you do storage stability as part of the formulation development. And we can do it in a couple of different ways. We can do it at elevated temperature, where we use some mathematical plotting to end up at a two year shelf life, or we can run it in real time for one years and two years. Um, if we find that a formulation, there is no way can uh, last, have the potency, the AI potency for two years, then we by law have to place an expiration date on the product. If we find that we can last either in uh, high temperature modeling or uh, real time stability for two years, there is no expiration dated needing by the EPA. There are no, there is no rhyme or reason for a specific formula having a specific stability date or expiration date or time of use. You know, it's, we, we would hope, we FMC, as well as I'm sure my other company colleagues, hope that we can sell our products through to the end user in less than two years. That's always a good thing. Um, but we have found older products, you know, an old product shows up with a, you know, a manufacturing date that's eight years old and you analyze it and it's perfectly fully potent and uh, has good quality metrics, good suspensibility, uh, good emulsion quality. You know, we build long, long um, stability into our products. But there really is no rhyme or reason. I can't say to you a microemulsion lasts longer or shorter than a suspension concentrate. One of the things you want to look for, to be blunt, is um, when you have suspended products, whether it's a suspension concentrate or a uh, micro encapsulated product, is that it's not hard settled on the bottom, that a couple of inversions of product and the, and the product reconstitutes to make a nice flowable system. All right, thanks, Bob. Um, so the next one here from Jennifer is, uh, and Ben, you might want to chime in on this one as well. What kind of water would you recommend using with uh, pesticide applications? What water would you use uh, mixing? Is there anything you'd watch out for with a water source? 
Bob, you want to So again, if I were choosing waters, I would choose um, a relatively sanitary water source. So whether it's um, a deep well or a municipal water, anything drinkable is a better water for dilution than let's say a, um, a, um, a, a puddle, a small pond, a uh, a pond that has no depth to it. Um, what you don't want is a lot of suspended material in the water for dilution. Um, you don't want a high chlorine content. I don't think that would be good. I certainly wouldn't suggest taking water out of a pool, for instance, or even out of a saltwater pool. Um, I would not worry about having deionized water or, you know, some sort of purified water beyond uh, your typical potable water. Yeah. That, I can't really point. think of anything else, Ben. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point, Bob. The, uh, the points that Bob mentioned are, are spot on. So any water that you feel comfortable uh, cooking with, drinking, if it's, if it's like city water, municipality water, uh, it, it's all good. Avoid the waters that, that Bob mentioned and why those waters are, are uh, the, you know, the recommended ones because they don't have a lot of suspended material. They don't have a lot of uh, biological materials floating that's not visible that could impede the product uh, or the bioefficacy of the mixture. Uh, the other thing, water that's, that's got a around neutral to slightly alkaline, you know, pH typically is, is reasonable. So avoid waters that are known to be too acidic or too alkaline, um, et cetera, so. Yeah, one other thing I'll comment to water is that, um, again, we look, formulators look, and FMC does, and certainly our, uh, our colleagues and other companies, we look at waters with various hardnesses. We have specific tests to look at, for instance, very soft water, 20 ppm of uh, divalent hardness. We look at 100 ppm hardness, 342 hardness, 500, and 1,000. Now, when, when we talk about liquid fertilizer ready products, then those are like super high. Um, these, are, these are the guys I worry about all the time are these uh, super high, uh, multivalent ion fertilizer liquids. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, for example, for those that use fertilizers, so this is just the general guidance, uh, fertilizers are usually have a pH of 5.5 to 6.5. Iron has, if you're mixing iron for turf application, has a liquid iron that is, has a pH is up in the range of three, so it's highly acidic. So when you combine all, all these, you have a combination of pHs uh, that could imp that could impede um, you know the the final tank mix. That's why we recommend when, whenever you're combining these ingredients to do a jar test. So absolutely, uh, Sam. Yeah, no, that that's excellent. Thank you both. I think uh, that's some great input for everybody here. Um, so it is 11:30 now. Uh, so if you have taken the quiz. Um, please feel free to drop off. I am gonna ask our speakers to, to answer the last two questions that have come in here. But um, again, please feel free to, um, to hop off so long as you've taken that quiz. Uh, real so quick, before question. you, before, yeah. yeah, real quick, sorry. Before you do that, I'm gonna put into the chat a link to register for our next webinar. So while you're on here listening, an easy way to register for next month instead of waiting for an email, just go ahead and click on that and listen to our Q&A. Sorry. No, excellent, Ed. Thanks for the catch on that one. Um, so the next question we have here, um, and hopefully Andrew is one of our, our biggest Micron fans and, and not a bear rep in disguise, but uh, Andrew asked, I didn't see any downsides listed to products formulated like Micron. Uh, what are the cons to a, a micro emulsion formulation? And, and Bob and Ben, I don't think this necessarily has to be specific to insecticides. But um, you know, maybe microemulsions for, for other formulation 
or for other types of pesticides like herbicides or fungicides could be uh, a good topic here as well. So I'll make the first comment. So let's see how we do. I guess the one downside to micro emulsions, um, you don't see many as you don't see many micro emulsion products for herbicides. And the reason why is because there is a large surfactant and oil load in the formulation and it can lead to collateral phytotoxicity, okay? From an insecticide point of view, whether it's perimeter, um, indoor use, whatever the case may be, there are very few downsides. Uh, again, super hard water would be a downside, but probably not as readily as most other formulations. Um, yeah, I, I can't, yeah, I, they're just great formulas. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can speak to this as well, uh, Sam and Bob, from a, uh, a biology standpoint, so from uh, plants. So while the micro emulsions create more particle size per square inch or per, per area, which would, would, which would maximize the AI contact of the target pest, which is desirable for higher efficacy. When it comes to plants and leaf tissue, uh, there's, there, that could become, and Bob mentioned could be phytotoxicity. That phytotoxicity really occurs because that coverage creates sort of a film that may impede the natural air oxygen exchange between the interior of the plant cells to the you know to the atmosphere. That's one. The other thing there are atmospheric conditions such as leaf surface temperature, air temperature, relative humidity, plant water uh, content. So if the plant is under stress, uh, it may not withstand that being uh, applied to the surface and hence uh, results in, in potential phyto. And that's really why over my years of experience, you don't see a lot of micro emulsions uh, used as, as herbicides. And, and I think Bob explained it as, as a chemist, what, you know, what, why that's the case. So I'm explaining it from a biology, the, there's potential for higher, um, uh, issues to the plant breathing, if you will, breathing, uh, you know, air quotes, just because of that. Yeah, well said guys, thank you both. Uh, so the last question here, uh, another one from Jennifer. So her question was, what would you recommend for use in high humidity and or moisture climates? So I, I think uh, any information you can give here about how moisture impacts different formulations, uh, I think would be interesting for the group. So if you're talking about atmospheric moisture, okay, there's a couple of different, there's a couple of different issues. Number one, um, even if you have good packaging and whether you're talking about um, pesticide on fertilizer, for instance, um, whether you have a dispersible granule, whether you have even wettable powders, if you have good packaging that is not open, it should withstand any sort of uh, atmospheric humidity for long periods of time. FMC, for instance, my, in my group, what we do is we look at high humidity conditions as part of storage stability. Uh, we look at 80% relative humidity for prolonged periods of time to make sure products like dispersible granules, wettable powders, um, don't clump up. You know, the last thing a guy needs in the field is a clumpy product. Like you have to kind of have to break it up and, you know, is, is it uh, homogeneous? Is it fully potent? You know, what's, what's the deal there? And quite often our dispersible granules are sold as our other companies are sold in uh, hard walled bottles, so to speak, with a thermos seal on it. Um, 
the other thing is, you know, once you open the bag, all bets are off. I mean, you, everybody knows that if you put out um, that de-icing salt on your driveway, that uh, the quarter of bag left at the end of the year, uh, the next year is just one clump, okay? And fertilizers will act the same way. They, they are what is called deliquescent. They absorb moisture. So whether it's fertilizers or uh, wettable powders, anything that will readily disperse into water will also absorb water on standing. So good packaging and um, good resealability of open packaging, whether that's putting that into an outer Ziploc bag of some type or putting it into a, uh, uh, a, a threaded five gallon pail in between uses might be a good uh, method of avoiding absorption of water into the formula. All right, uh, well said, Bob. And I think that is the last question we had coming through the Q&A here. Uh, we will go through the chat and make sure that any questions that came in there get answered after the fact. But uh, thank you everybody for participating. Um, Ed, do you have any closing comments on the quiz or CEUs? I would just say if, if there are any issues with CEUs after the fact, please don't worry. Uh, things happen, snafus happen with the states or whatever. We, we, we will always be in communication and here to take care of them for you. So we've never had an issue that wasn't resolved. So just know that going forward. And thank you for a great presentation. All right, yes, thanks Ben and Bob. Uh, that was a great presentation and a great Q and A. And thanks to everybody who joined us here today and uh, participated. Uh, we will see you next month. Uh, remember we are back a week for the holiday weekend uh, and be sure to check the link in the chat there to register for the next